Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. I say turn with me, and most of us are apping over there and getting there one way or the other. <coughs> Ephesians 4. Scrolling, that's the word. Scrolling there. <laughs> All right, Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, go down to verse 9. Ephesians 4 and verse 9. Now, I want to remind you guys, nobody nobody believes this part. Well, we've said it before. Um, as we're working these, through these things, especially on Wednesday nights, we're working the, through them in a, in a, in a way that, that we're wrestling through these things. Now, note that like, I... I've wrestled through these things. You've wrestled through these things, perhaps. But we can do that together as well. In other words, if, you, if you're thinking through something, ask, ask questions. Right? We need that. Uh, we need to not just say, okay, well, I, okay, I got that. Sure. I'll log it somewhere back in the memory bank. But that we're actually thinking through the things that we're seeing in Scripture and the things that we're wrestling through. Okay? So I know I'm going to say, it, do that. Ask questions. I know sometimes we, we don't, but... but uh, Please, please think through these things. All right, so Ephesians 9, or Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, uh, verse 9. It says, now this, is, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? And he's, re he's pointing back to a, a passage of Scripture that's quoted in verse 8. When he ascends on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So he says in verse 9, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended, verse 10, is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things, Christ. Verse 11, and he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by, uh, by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now we're going to, we're going to, look at or answer the question tonight of hopefully hopefully see this in scripture of what the purpose of the church is so to, to kind of recap a little bit the first week that we met on a Wednesday we looked at a broad thing of exactly just what what's the definition of a church we talked about the assembling uh, the saints that are gathered together 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 the saints that are gathered together under the preaching and teaching of the word we talked about the fellowship part we talked about all these different aspects of the church because that's what makes up the church and um and then we talked about kind of the foundation of the church christ being the head the church being the bride of christ um and then the church is the pillar and support of the truth of of the gospel itself in a way so we looked at those different ways in which the scriptures um give a picture for the church now i want to look at a a kind of a I know we use the word foundation, and I've used it a lot. Scripture actually uses the word foundation a lot, too, so it's a good word to use. But we talk about the foundation, and hopefully you're able to follow the language that we use. And the language that the Bible uses is that the word foundation is used often, and it might say different things to the foundation. So we know at one point last week or a few weeks ago, we mentioned that Christ Jesus was the foundation of the church. Absolutely, right? He's the head of the church. He's the foundation. But we also talk about Scripture being the foundation. In other words, that the church does, you know, that follows Scripture. And we'll talk about that in here. That doesn't mean that one's not true. They're both true at the same time because Christ gives Scripture. 
Um, so when I say tonight that the purpose of the church, what the purpose of the church is, the foundation of the church in a way, I simply mean the principles that everything else is built upon. This, this, this main principle, and we're going we're gonna to look at one, one main thing, one thing really solely, and then expand from there. And that thing is that the church is made and given, just like everything else, for the glory of God. It absolutely has to be for the glory of God. Now that's, that's easy in the sense of it's easy to d defend that because Scripture says that everything is for God's glory. It gets down to the most benign thing that you do every day, right? 1 Corinthians 10. Do everything, eating and drinking, for the glory of God. So the church is part of that, right? Everything. The church is made for the glory of God, the glorification of Christ himself. Because he's the head, he's the one that gave himself up for the church. Uh, we went through Ephesians 5 a few weeks ago, uh, and, and, and Robert took us kind of walked through it, through that idea that we're the bride of Christ. This is who we are. Um, and so Christ is, is saved the church for this reason, to make much of Christ, to glorify God in Christ. That's the chief end of the church. Everything, and I mean this, I, I want to be careful how I say these words because I want you to hear them as what the words are. Sometimes we use words and we use them hyperbolically. Certainly we do that, right? Um, we, we might say things about how tired we are or how hungry we are, right? That are, We say it hyperbolically. In other words, we say, I can, I'm so hungry I can eat an elephant. Well, that's not literal because you can't. Well, at least not at one sitting. But you mean it. I'm gonna I'm gonna use this outlandish example to show how serious I'm about this thing. But I'm not being hyperbolic in this. Everything, absolutely everything in the church must be to this end. Everything is for the glorification of God in Christ Jesus. So that means the preaching and the teaching, every aspect of that is for the glory of God. Not, and, and to be clear, what that means is it's not to the glory of man. <coughs> right? We don't teach primarily. Now, part of teaching is that you will be edified, right? Part of wrestling through these things from Scripture is that you would be edified. It's like when, a, when, when mom or dad cook a meal, you're going to be filled by that meal phys physically. But it's hopefully maybe not just for that, right? Primarily... If you're a believer, that even the meal that you cook is for the glorify, glorifying of God. It does fill, but it's for God's glory. And that's what this is. Preaching and teaching, if it is about, if it is completely about God's glory, then it's not about us, primarily. We are not the focus of that. It is about God. And so we might think, well, why doesn't that teaching and preaching, why doesn't it, why doesn't it say more about me? And, and why doesn't... <laughs> Make me feel a certain way that I want to be, that I want to feel. I remember uh, being in a church one time and someone said something like, um, I, I, I was probably bashing TV preachers, which is, if you've ever listened to me, then I don't mind doing that. Because um, I think we're called, supposed to call out darkness and that is certainly a deception in itself. But I was saying something about that and, and uh, something about um, that, like we, we, don't, we don't come to hear to the Word of God to tell us what we want to feel good, right? And, and I had somebody tell me, like, well, you know what? Sometimes I want to feel good. I just want to feel good. I want to leave feeling good about who I am and all the things that I've done. And they're missing the gospel because the gospel is straight truth. And it doesn't matter how we feel about it. It really doesn't. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It matters what it says. It matters what the truth is, Right? <laughs> We'll use this illustration a million times because it's so easy to make. But no doctor goes in to give bad news and says, but this news is going to hurt their feelings, so I'm not going to tell them. No, you'll be disbarred, right? Or whatever doctors are, you know, whatever happens to doctors. And he should be, right? Yeah. Because he did not tell the truth. And that's what we're called to do. Even when you read the scriptures yourself, you're called to see the truth in them, not to see the part that 
only makes you feel good. Now, the scriptures make you feel good. Oftentimes, yes, they're encouraging, right? But that doesn't mean that you open the Bible going, okay, God, make me feel good right now. Make me feel good about myself. No, no. What does the Bible say? What does it mean? And I'm going to conform to that. And if that is the way the Holy Spirit uses to, to make me feel good, then absolutely. It made me feel full of joy or encouraged. But oftentimes the Bible doesn't do that. Sometimes the Bible makes us feel, you know, beat up. Right? We go to the Word and the Word just convicts and pricks our hearts and stirs in us and rebukes us. And we need that as well. So the preaching, the teaching, uh, this goes without saying, but just the worship. What we do, and worship is everything, but of course, music, the songs that we sing, the fellowship, the prayer, all of this is for God's glory. Now, we might fellowship together thinking, I love this. I want to be around other Christians because that part does make me feel good. Most of the time, fellowship doesn't make us feel bad. Sometimes we get a preaching, you know, conviction or whatever. But fellowship is almost always encouraging. Generally speaking, you're not in fellowship and then go home feeling worse about that, right? Hopefully not. Maybe convicted, sure. By other Christians and things like that maybe but but certainly there's an encouraging aspect to that but even the fellowship even when we eat a meal together on a Sunday that is has a singular focus of glorifying God of making much of Christ and if you burn the chicken and dumplings that doesn't matter because this is not about you or me you and your feelings because you burnt the chicken and dumplings or mine that I have to eat chicken and dumplings that are burnt it matters that we glorify God right Nobody does that, by the way. We just, you know, as an example, nobody. I'm sure nobody's ever done that before. But no, that's that's what we're for, that's what we're doing these things for, for God's glory. Our money, every dime that goes into the church, it's not our money, by the way. It's not ours. It's the Lord's. But the structure of the church, the elders, the deacons, any part of the church is to God's glory. And so I think sometimes when we think about just those things, we think about, well, what do I need? To, what do I want to do with this? And if it's something that's clearly making much of ourselves, then that's, that's really missing the point. And oftentimes, I think churches are structured even. I think I've been in churches like this. This is the last church I was in like this. They, they had an idea. What do we like? What do we want to do as far as the structure is concerned? So if we want to have this committee over here that does the flower committee or whatever, you know, churches have that, or, or whatever. It's, the idea kind of comes from, well, what do we think about this? What is this? What makes most sense for us? Rather than is this is this glorifying God? And we'll talk about fleshing that out in a minute. But that's what it's for. And we must have accountability in this way. We 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 need accountability in this way. All of us do. Um, and so this this glorifying God and glorifying God in Christ Jesus. Um, this must be the heart of the church. It must be the heart of the church. That's something that a Christian should, should feel, in a way, when they go into a church. When they come into our, when our group of believers, they know, like, these are people that want to make much of Christ. They might not do everything right. They might do things I don't really like. They might do a few things that I'm like, I don't know about that. That's, that seems kind of silly or whatever. You might think that about a lot of things. But, but hopefully, there is this heartbeat of the church that, is, that the church is trying to make much of Christ. We'll make wrong decisions. Um, there'll certainly be things like that. There'll be tough times, good times. But is the church all about the glory of God? And is it, like, like our culture, of course, we think about church in the way of very pragmatic, so kind of like the whole Burger King slogan of we do it your way. Uh, there was a guy that uh, I think I, we were listening to, uh, um, Robert and I were listening to a, a teacher the other night talking about this he said there was a guy named Robert Schuler back in the day he was a televangelist kind of guy and he he polled like he would send out these questionnaires to unbelievers and ask them what do you like about church church is not about them church is not about the pagan next door that's not what it's for and so we're not trying to allure the pagan we want to preach the gospel certainly the people that come to Christ but it's not about it's not about us. It's not about our desires. You might think, well, I really like this thing or I really like that thing. It's not about us. Now some of those things are okay. And some of those things are different. We're not talking about theology, right? We're not talking about this preacher likes the virgin birth and this one over here doesn't. Well that doesn't matter because one of them's a heretic and one of them's not. Right? That's not the same thing. 
But desires and things like that must be shaped by desire to glorify God. That has to be it. And I want to, hopefully you'll hear this in the way I mean this and not in some other, um, no other way. But we oftentimes think the church is about saving souls. Oh, God, we've got to save souls, got to save souls. That's not the primary task of the church. The primary task is making much of God. The primary task is making much of Christ Jesus himself. So we're not... We're not constantly shifting everything to how can we get people to come in or get people to be attracted to the Lord. He does that on his own. He's God. But everything is about God's glory. And it's kind of like the first and second commandment uh, that Jesus gave, right? If you love God, he says the second greatest commandment is love neighbor. But if you love God, everything else flows out of that, right? Everything else comes from that. So you have a whole culture, for instance, that is very humanitarian in our culture now. We love to, what, people genuinely do want to help their neighbors sometimes. Not always, but um, sometimes they really want to help neighbors. They want to give to certain different, you know, uh, humanitarian aid groups when a tornado or a hurricane comes through. People give and things like that. And that's, that's not a bad thing. But that's, that can be done without any love for God. That can be just, a, well, we, we like our neighbors. We're going to help them out. If God is not the primary focus there, then everything else falls apart. And we, we see that because there are plenty of pagans that have a temporary or a kind of a, 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 a you know, halfway care about their neighbor in a way sometimes. Um, and we see that. But it has to come for the believer. Everything is about God's glory. So even the church is about God and his glory. Even the salvation of sinners is about God and his glory. Not about heaven and hell. Certainly a byproduct, but not about, it must be about God's glory. And really, the principle that, that I'm alluding to here is that, that God is the both the means and the ends. So you probably heard churches say stuff like this. Hey, listen, we'll do whatever it takes if only one soul is saved. And that sounds good. That sounds good. But that's not the focus. The focus must be, we'll do whatever it takes if God is glorified. Because Jeremiah was going out there, and he didn't have any converts. Nobody was listening to what Jeremiah said and didn't seem like. Everybody hated that guy. And if he was going out there for converts, then he's going to feel pretty bad at the end of the day when they threw him in the ditch and wanted to kill him, or threw him in the well, right? Um, so we must be about... God's glory in both the means and the ends. So we don't say, well, we'll do whatever it takes because the ends is, is good enough that people will be saved. Well, no. Our task is to glorify God in absolutely everything. Both the means and the ends is about glorifying God. And that means, you know, we want to glorify God no matter what. If that means us getting out of the way, if that means us doing whatever it takes for God to be glorified, then we want to do that. Um, and that's hard sometimes for us. We think, what about me? Where, where, do I, where do I fit in in this? Sometimes our fitting in, it means get out of the way and let the Lord work, you know? I mean, not that the Lord's going to need us to get out of the way or nothing, but, but that we are faithful in those things to whatever the Lord desires. Um, like what glorifies God the most? So John Bunyan, the guy that wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he went to jail. He spent a lot of his life in jail, more than more than a decade in prison, because. And here's the reason why. Uh, so he was preaching as a nonconformist. He wouldn't conform to the law about getting a license to preach because he was a Baptist and he really couldn't. And so he said, "I'm not. I'm not going to do that." So they threw him in jail. And after a while, they're like, "Man, you can go home to your family, right now. All you have to do is make one promise that you won't preach." And it wasn't like in our day where he says, okay, Robert, you've got to go to jail uh, if, as long as you don't preach. But there's 50,000 other Baptist preachers around and were faithful preachers, you know. No, 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 I mean, it wasn't like there were guys around there. They needed men to preach the gospel. And he could have said, no, 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 okay, I'll, I'll, not, I'll be faithful, but I won't preach. He said, no, that's, that's what God's called me to do. These people need shepherds. They need people to minister the gospel to them. And so in a way, he willfully stayed in jail. And there are probably people nowadays that would be like, what is this guy doing? 
Doesn't he know he's he's not really caring for his family like that? He could be much better use if he would just, you know, just accept this and just get out of there. No, I'm going to be faithful to the Lord, even if it means whatever. Because glorifying God is more important than my being comfortable or my feeling good or whatever. This must be a conviction of the church. This must be the heart of the church. Um, this must be the conviction of, of, of any leader or any elder that the church has. We've talked about this in, in this process as, as, as we're growing in a church um, and we're kind of wrapping these things up and seeing what Scripture has and trying to follow these different avenues of what Scripture has told us to do. Part of this is you, as a body of believers, have to, in a way, affirm the, the elders and the leaders of the church. The leaders of the church don't show up and say, by the way, I'm the leader, everybody else follow. That's not how it works. The church as a whole is responsible for the affirmation of those men. And so in a way, we talked about this, you have to evaluate me. You have to evaluate Robert. You have to look at us and say, are these actually godly men? Are these actually men who are following after the Lord? Are they faithful to do what the Bible says? Are they faithful in all the ways that Paul has laid out to Timothy and Paul has laid out to Titus as elders should be? Are they those men? If they're not, move on. That's not a, that's not a question. It's easy. Move on if they're not, right? Get rid of them. Move on or whatever. So that must be a, a conviction of the church as they evaluate us, as they evaluate leaders. Um, and that must be a conviction of the leaders themselves. If the leaders aren't living, and, and may that never be a, a doubt in your mind that your leaders are not so concerned with God's glory. May that never be a doubt for us even as a collective that we are, are we, are we changing a direction? Are we making this more about us? Or do we care more about God's glory? We need to be committed so much to God's glory that we will, we will evaluate, we will cut off, we will change, we will remove, we will do whatever it takes to make sure that that is the means and the ends of everything that we do. We must. Now, that is, that is that foundation, that is that principle that pushes everything else. Now, if we're going to answer, though, clearly what the purpose of the church is, then we're not just seeing a, a purpose that is... Ha we want to see the purpose fleshed out, right? So what is the purpose of the church? The purpose of the church is in that primary thing to glorify and honor God in Christ Jesus, right? But how is that fleshed out? I don't mean how we glorify God because that's a million things. Uh, but what does that look like in, in a way of, of kind of pulling that apart a little bit? Um, so a church... In, in its purpose, in this way, and we'll look at this passage I read out of Ephesians um, to, to glean much from. So first, we're actually, if we're in Ephesians 4, go to Ephesians 5. Um, we're going to use some terms that I used a few weeks ago. And we're not going to pull these things all, all the way apart, but we're going to look at them as far as in, a, in the way of God's design for the church and His purpose in these things and why they're there. Um, or at least... Maybe not why they're there, but what what their purpose is. So um, I used a few terms that we're going to look at tonight. Um, three terms that we talked about that the church is. Uh, the church is purity and verity, which is truth, and then um, unity. And we'll take them in that order. The first is purity, which is essentially being obedient to the Lord, right? That he is sanctifying us. And part of that is just being obedient, being, <coughs> making sure that everything that we're doing is out of obedience to Christ because that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're glorifying God. So our purpose is in that way to obey what God has said to glorify him. So Ephesians 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might what? What's that next verse? You probably know it. You probably remember it. So that he might sanctify her. He might make her more like himself. He might purify her is another word for that. 
Purify her, sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. He wants to purify the church. And one of the ways that God is, is sanctifying in the church, it is in the unity, it is in the verity of the, the truth being preached, but, but it shows itself in the obedience of the church, in the obedience of uh, the people in the church. And he says, he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, it's important, verse 27, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory. That he might present to, the, to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So as a church, whatever decision that we make, absolutely whatever it is, where do we go to? How do we make those decisions? Well, that starts with, obviously, that desire to glorify God, but has He given us direction? Has He given us clarity on which way to go? Have he, has He given us a structure? Has He given us a path by which to follow? Absolutely. Absolutely He has. And He has given that in His Word. So we must be a people that do what the Bible says. Now, I know that sounds incredibly simple. And I, I know that every church would say, well, we all want to do what the Bible says. I don't think there's a church in Union County that wouldn't say we want to do what the Bible says. I think most of them would say that. But by some of the stuff that, the, that churches historically do, do you think that they do it because that's what the Bible tells them to do? Do you think that when people structure a church, I, I've been in churches and I, and they'll structure things. Um, they'll have things in the church and I'm thinking, where did you get this from? Because this is not found in any scripture. And in 2,000 years of church history, you've done it in a way that is like almost no one. I don't even know how you did this. In 2,000 years of church history, people have done church in a million different ways. But you picked a way that almost no one else has ever done. And it makes no sense because there's no reasonable way that you would follow this path. There's no reasonable way from the scriptures that you would go in this direction. But they have. But we can't be that way, right? Our structure, our order, our worship, the way we do a service, everything has to be by what scripture says. And we want to be rigid on this, by the way. We don't want to be flexible on this, right? That's one thing that it feels like churches kind of feel flexible. Like, well, we're just kind of not, even if they're not saying they're shifting with the culture, but they feel like they're trying to be flexible. They're trying to be like rigidity. The word rigid is, you know, most churches don't want to feel that way. Oh, you're just one of those stuffy old, you're just too hardcore about this thing. But the church needs to be rigid about how they follow scripture. They absolutely need to be rigid on what the scripture says. We can't, be cowards about what this church or what the scriptures say, right? We can't be cowards both in our teaching from the pulpit. We can't be cowards in the things that we say that we're going to do in the church. We can't be cowardice when we when we you know are 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 um, shaped and molded by culture. No, absolutely not. We want to be firm and even rigid, even hard in a way about what scripture says. Now, if the scriptures say to do something that we're not doing, well, then we want to be shaped and molded. We want to be pliable in the Lord's hands. Obviously, that's true. But we do not in any way, shape, or form want to be um, <laughs> flexible or want to be moldable by the things of the culture or the things of our own hearts, but by what the scriptures say. That's so important. And, and listen, I, I know that these are these are truths that nobody's going, nah, I don't know about that one. That one's nah, that's, that's crazy. These are obvious truths. They should be to us in a way. But they have to be firm laid down. Or everything that we do in one year or five years or ten years or fifty years, Lord willing, everything that we do can be blown up. So we must be firm and rigid on following the scriptures. And I'm going to tell you, that's going to be difficult. You think, well, no, 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 everybody says that. It will be difficult. It absolutely will be difficult. It will be counter-cultural. It will be counter to what the culture wants you to do. It will be. I've sat in meetings 
with church men and women that would say, we know that's what the Bible says, but. I've heard that out of too many mouths. I've heard that out of too many men's mouths, men and women, who would say that exact phrase. I hate that phrase. It is, it's such a blasphemy against God almost. It is, we know what the Bible says, but we're really not willing to do it. And these are conservative churches. These are conservative churches. Or what we think are conservative churches, you know. And that, that's such a frustration. At one point it breaks your heart. At the other point it makes you want to just wring somebody's neck, right? Because we, we play around with these things like they're not that big a deal. Um, but we can't. Because we must be rigid and obedient even when they're uncomfortable. Right? Like in our culture, it's going to be really difficult. Uh, it won't be difficult in the sense of preaching the truth. But have y'all ever been in a, y'all ever been in a, a, a church or, or a, even a conference where somebody preached on something and you felt like, man, eesh, this is rough. I mean, they're preaching something true, but like, like you feel like, man, this is like you could cut the tension in here with a knife. It's just palpable. Like I was at a church one time where uh, one of the guys from that study we did, the, his name was Richard Owen Roberts. He was that guy that was 150 years old, or it looks like it, you know. He's actually 90. I think he just had a birthday. He's pretty old. But I was in a service one time, and he was talking to uh, he was talking to the church, and the church was a KJV only church, and he didn't know it, and he had been there several years, and he was like, "What are you doing? Like that's stupid." And he was really, you know, forthright with them. And they needed that. And, you know, I'm over here. I'm just a guest. I don't go to this church. I don't know these people. And it felt like, man, this is heavy. This is uncomfortable. And I'm a person that I don't mind creating awkwardness. But I do not want to be in a situation where somebody else creates it. It, it, it almost is, you know, that people say it, it's, it, it's cringy. I don't know if that's a cool word or whatever. But, like, it feels just like, oh, you know, it's just like it's closing in on you. Um, but sometimes, like, you, we might, we might, we're going to go through a text of Scripture that will feel that way. And it's not even because we're, we're, we're preaching, at, like, like, that was very direct. The preacher, uh, he was going, he was bringing that to the church. It's so like, like Paul writing to the Corinthians, you've sinned. You are, the, you are an issue. And he's directing that to them. We're going to go through texts of Scripture. They're going to feel heavy um, just because of the culture. Just because of the culture we're in. Audrey, walk over to your mother right now. Um, but that's what the text gives, right? So when I'm preaching these things, or Robert's preaching these things, or anybody's preaching these things or teaching these things in, in Scripture, they care, the Scripture carries the weight. It's not even the application. It's just the Scripture themselves. So it might be uncomfortable or whatever. Um, it might be uncomfortable on the inside and the outside. But truth does this. And we must be a people who are obedient. And that is the purpose of the church. That we are obedient to those scriptures. And we're fulfilling that in a purity way. Because if the church is meant to glorify God. Now we, we probably spend so much of our time thinking about the church as being like. It is a lighthouse, right? It is a, it is a banner of Christ to the world. But, like, we're, we're obedient to Christ. We don't care about the world when it comes to, like, doing what the world wants. We conform to Christ. We conform to Christ. Uh, but in whatever we're doing, even if the world doesn't care about it, if it's apathetic, or if the world hates it, we don't, we're, we're still that light for the gospel, right? Um, but we're not, even if the world never even comes around, even the world says, you, can, you do whatever you want to in your little corner over there. And we don't, we're not even going to come around. Still, we want to be an example to the world because we're glorifying Christ in that. So that's part of that purpose. Of course, another part is is what's called um, verity, which is truth. You know, um, it's it's proclaiming that truth. So go back to Ephesians chapter four and and look down at verse twelve. We read this earlier. He says. Verse 11, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Now, by the way, I don't think that every church should have an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, and a pastor and a teacher. Some people break those things up. I think he's speaking in general terms. I think that's what Paul's doing. 
Because I don't think he's saying, he gave some of these things, so all you guys are going to have these things. So every church needs an apostle, right? Um, you probably already know this, but if any of you or me say something about you being an apostle, or I say something about you being an apostle, go somewhere else, you know, or, or kick me out or, or whatever. That's, if you turn on your TV and you hear that guy saying, I'm an apostle of whatever, or of Christ, yeah, no. He's not. Um, but anyway, they, they were only, there were only 12. One was a betrayer, and then they replaced him. That's it. Um, but then he goes to verse 12. For the equipping, what, so he gave all these men. So it starts with the apostles, right? The apostles go out and they preach Christ's truth. They set the structure and the order of the church through letters, through their own mi uh, mission, ministry, I guess to these churches, they're going around all these churches, kind of starting to shape the church in the way it should look. Now, they're not doing that, obviously. Christ is doing that, but it's through them, through the ministry of the apostles, and then it kind of pours down into the church, and they're structuring these things and showing, and writing these things, First, Second Timothy, you know, Corinthians, Peter, all these things, right? And then it's it's all, all the, the men that God has given the church, so elders primarily, but also really everybody in the in the shaping of this um, as a unity, as a unified group, for what? Verse 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So in this truth that the church is a part of, it's preaching and teaching and exemplifying truth truth which is scripture which is god's truth and it's doing so how well that's that's what we do when we make disciples right when we make disciples the, the one of the primary tasks of the church the purposes of the church are it's proclaiming this truth but in that is making disciples so raising up <laughs> godly men and women and the next generation for the cause of christ and so we do that we do that in the preaching and the teaching of the truth um, primarily to the church itself. Now, I want to be clear about this. Anytime that we preach and teach, it says that these men, these, these apostles and prophets, and, and then, of course, to us, pastors and elders, in the context of the local church, when we preach a sermon, um, we preach for us. Now, we preach for the Lord, to glorify God, right? But, but in that, we're preaching to the church. So, so we're not saying, okay, we're bringing all these people in. Because I, I remember the, the, this weird idea that some churches have. And this guy, he voiced it perfectly one time. And I was in a church. Same church as the guy from the other story, I guess. Um, he told me, he said, he said, uh, do you, you need to be preaching to all the lost people. You need to pre 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 be preaching to all the lost people. You're not, you need to be, every sermon should be evangelistic. And, of course, every sermon is in a way because you're preaching Christ. But he said, you need to be just preaching about all the lost people. I kid you not. I said, yeah, well, maybe we do have a lot of lost people in our church. He said, what? Lost people in our church? We don't have any. You think there are lost people in our church? That's crazy. And I'm like, well, you just told me that we need to preach to all the lost people. Then you tell me there are no lost people in the church. That's the absurdity. Like, Okay, if there are no lost people in the church, then why am I preaching to the lost people if that's all the people here? What are you here for? Then, of course, the, by your own testimony, you're saying you don't really need this. And that my job is to just go preach to lost people. <coughs> why do we have a church at all then? Because we can do that on the corner with a bullhorn. But we don't because God has given us a church of believers, an assembly of believers. And that when we proclaim the gospel, of course, our, our children, many of our children are not in Christ. So they're going to hear the gospel. We're not preaching to them in a way. And we are in a way because they're hearing it and they're going to receive it hopefully and the Lord willing that the Lord will save, right? But primarily it's for the equipping of the saints. That's the purpose, believe it or not. Now we want men to come to Christ. We want our children to come to Christ. And sometimes there might be seekers in the church that come to Christ. And we'll talk about what that looks like another time. But we must be preaching primarily to the church itself. But even in a proclamation way, right? In a proclamation way, what we preach and teach is, even if the world's not in the church with us, because they aren't, right? 
it still makes a proclamation to the world. It still makes a proclamation to the world because we're preaching truth and we're firm to the world of these truths. So when we do this, when we're standing firm on the Word of God, we're standing firm to a world that believes in homosexuality or whatever. We're standing firm on a world that believes in lies. And we say, no, we don't have to go on CNN to, to make this proclamation. We make it every time we meet together. We make that proclamation to the world. They might not see it, they might not care, but it's still there. And it's still a condemnation to the world, by the way. Think about how much condemnation will be brought more so in America than it will to whatever country in the Middle East that's never heard the gospel, that doesn't have a, a church on every corner. Like, God will certainly judge many, especially in the Bible Belt, for rejecting Christ. Say, just imagine, just imagine the man that is in, before God in judgment, that he will say, but, but Lord, I didn't know your gospel. I never went to those churches, and they never came to me. So I never really heard it. I was there, but I never really, you know, nobody ever really shared it with me. I mean, the churches were, but I never really went. I was going to say, so? They were there. They were proclaiming truth. It doesn't mean you were in the service. It doesn't mean they had to go get you and drag you to the service. That's not what it looks like. But there's still a proclamation to the world around you. And that's what, that's what we are. We're firm. And we're preaching truth no matter what. Um, we do that in discipleship, right? In, in, in raising up the next generation of believers. Um, hopefully, Lord willing. We do that in the true, uh, in true teaching and growing in the faith. That's something that we have to understand. When we come to church, when I think about church in the sense of um, other contexts, oftentimes it's like, well, everybody's kind of here. We're kind of getting a pick-me-up for the week. And that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like church is about. Growing up, that seemed to be the case. That we're all Christians here, we're here because we're supposed to be here, and this kind of gets me through my week. And then if somebody's sick, I can call everybody to pray for me. That's not it. We need to be growing in discipleship, in, in theology, in learning about who God is, in our closeness with Christ, in genuine holiness, in our depth of knowing. The, the word mentioned here was doctrine, right, or the, uh, knowledge. Verse 13 says, until we all attain to the unity of Christ, or unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God. By the way, Paul's writing to the church. To the church. So why would Paul write to the church who already know about God, about knowing and having the knowledge of God? Because that's not something we quit. That's something we grow in. So Lord willing, in five years, our church will look, not just physically look different because of the ages on our faces or whatever, but also in the, in, in the knowledge of God because we're growing as a group, as a collective, and, and as, an in, as individuals. So we're growing in those things. We're being discipled. We had all the sorts of things when I was a kid called uh, discipleship training and all sorts of those things. And in hindsight, I don't know what kind of disciples we were made or what the kind of disciples were actually made. Basic, basic, basic things about the faith. We have kids uh, at, at our school. It's a Christian school. And not everybody there is a Christian. Absolutely not. Probably most of the, belief, most of the kids are probably not Christians. But they're all, most of them, the vast majority of them, are in church most Sundays, probably. Um, but we'll ask a bonus question on the quiz or say something about the basic Bible thing, you know. Um, who wrote the book of Romans? Or uh, the, uh, one, of the, the, uh, one of the teachers across the hall, he's a history teacher, but he, he does Bible bonuses, and they're almost always super easy. Well, what we would think would be easy. So his question the other day was, uh, who preached at Pentecost? Now, I think most of our children know that answer, hopefully. Don't, don't tell me. Don't say anything different. Don't say anything that's going to wreck this illustration here. But the point is, who's preaching at Pentecost? And, and these are teenagers. And, and most of the, a lot of them, well, not all, most of them, but a lot of them said, what's Pentecost? You're, you're in a church. Now, you, you definitely should be getting this at home, but you're in a church every week, and you don't know what Pentecost is. Now, that's, that doesn't mean that they've been raised up the way they should be. What we think discipleship is, our, our idea of discipleship is, in, in our culture, drive to the church, drop the kids off, drive off, or whatever, and they'll be discipled. That's not discipleship, right? 
There's a lot that goes into discipleship, but just to be clear, that truth needs to be pressed in. It needs to be turned in in us, in us. So when we're having conversations about this, you don't just know, okay, I get that that we want to follow the Bible. Well, why? And we understand the whys and the hows and the and the whats of Scripture and of truth. And so when you're in conversations in five years with your coworker, that that you'll be able to to glean more from the truth than you did now because you've grown in the knowledge of the Lord. You've grown in the knowledge of Scripture. You've grown in simple stuff. I mean, think about now, most of you, you've experienced very little corporate prayer, right, as a group. I don't mean us. That's true for us. But I mean, just in our lives. Because most churches don't say, hey, let's go spend as much time as we can in prayer corporately. But in five years, our prayer lives will benefit from that simply by us corporately praying and us talking about and teaching through things like prayer. It will be different, hopefully, in five years than it is now. Closer with the Lord. Um, and that comes through the teaching and the preaching and the ministry of the Word. Um, it comes through accountability. Because when we're true, when we're, when we're pressing forward the gospel, when we're pressing forward truth, when we're pressing forward uh, truth in discipleship, that's going to come forth in accountability. And so if, you, if you're part of that, the proclamation has to be made that this is sin or, or whatever. I told my wife today, we were, we were talking about this church. This church had a couple in it that uh, had a family. And um, husband was a jerk of a guy. Wife got sick of husband. Wife divorces husband. And they got a divorce. Husband, now he's off doing what he wants. And and the church did nothing, like no conversations, hardly nothing, nothing. And I and I, I told Katie it was frustration because we knew of this. We don't know this family. We knew of them. And I thought, like this is why I don't go to that church. This is exactly why I don't go to that church, because there's no accountability. Because I need, if I'm being an idiot at home, somebody to say, stop it. You're being an idiot. Or, or whatever, and it might be that harsh, or it might be different words used, but whatever. It, at the very least, there's that care and that love that truth has to be given, even if it is sharp and, and rigid and cuts. Because to cut out cancer, you're going to have to undergo the things that it takes, right? You're going to have to undergo a removing of flesh, and it's going to be hard, right? I think about I, I thought about this analogy the other day. It's an analogy we already talked about, we've used, but I thought about it more in the context of the church. One of the hardest things about church in our in our framework is when somebody comes to the hot or to the doctor or whatever, and they have cancer. Let's say like a cancerous lymph node or a spot on their body or you know a melanoma or something. Well, if it's if it's a cancer. And ideally, in the context of the church, I think that the church or the doctor in, in, in one of those cases would go and what would, he, what would he do? He would simply go in and, and cut the cancer out. And it'd be tough, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the worst. Like you might just have a simple spot that needs to be removed. And in the context of the church, that's what it should look like. Something has grown up here. This is some sin has arisen. We need to go care for that. Right? That might be a cutting, that might, whatever that is, right? It's an accountability of care for one another to speak truth and to care for that person, maybe harshly even in a way, right? But the church in America is not like that. The church in America is like stage five, their body is cancer all over it. Well, there's not a part you can just cut out to remove that, can you? What do you need? Well, you need. Like, what, what do we do in our country? It's, it's chemotherapy or whatever. I can't, you know, the medical field. What does chemotherapy do? What is the design of chemotherapy? Hopefully that it kills the cancer before the chemo kills you. Right? Because chemo will kill you. If any of us took chemo just for the sake of chemo, it's going to kill you. Because it is designed to kill. That's what its design is. And so you can't, it, it's almost like you're having to undergo total just this weight of of chemo and now apply that to the church the church in america it's not like just a plucking out and a cutting out of a few things that's not fun but it's a chemo that has to be over it right um and that's what that accountability is like 
in, in, in a godly church, though, hopefully you're not there, right? You, you don't want to ever get that point. You want to see it, pay attention to it, and be able to address it before, before it causes death, before it kills. That's what, that's what truth is in the context of the church. That's what the purpose of the church is, to help us be raised in this discipleship where we can be edified and grow, growing as believers. Because it, God is, if he is for us, then he is for our growth, our, our um, sanctification, right? And the last thing, of course, is, is the unity that we mentioned earlier. Um, he says in verse 13 again, he says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. He says, verse 14, he says, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and cared about by every wind of doctrine. Now, just to back up a little bit, when we're talking about the truth being presented, how can, the, how can you as an individual not be tossed to and fro by the waves of wild doctrine and every doctrine that comes about? Well, you say, and rightly so, we need to be in the, in the Word. Absolutely. Leaning on the Lord in Scripture and praying to Him. But what is the way, a visible representation, that the Lord uses as accountability, not just to go to the Word, but around you to kind of press you back to the Word? It's the church. It's the church. If I were on an island, I would be. I think it would be easier than we think to just, okay, here's something I kind of want to gravitate to or push to without the accountability of brothers and sisters in Christ. If I were my own, if I were my own accountability. But we need that. As a result of all these things, he says, that we're no longer tossed here and there by different doctrines, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. I've thought about this. I've seen, I've read and, and thought about guys falling into sins or even or even bad theology. And I thought, man, you know what? S seven or eight years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I'm thinking about when I was new, when I was a new believer, certainly 15, 20 years ago. I can imagine have fallen into that doctrine. In fact, I'm surprised every day that the Lord has been gracious to, to that I didn't. Like I look back and think, I, I didn't know anything. Some of that time I wasn't really invested in church like I should have been. When I went to church, but it wasn't an investment. It wasn't a connection. I didn't have men pressing me the right direction. It's only by the grace of God. Um, and I could have fallen into these things. And I've known men who, who did, who <coughs> fell in all sorts of thinking because they didn't have that framework around them. But here the scripture is saying, actually, the church is for that framework. It's for that, yeah, you know, like a, um, it's the scaffolding. Right or it's the uh, it's the stake in the ground that holds the 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 budding tree up while it stays straight rather than being knocked here and there. That's what the church is for. That's what the church is for. Um, but then he says in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to all grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. Verse 16, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So again, it goes back to that idea of unity. The church builds in unity, and that's part of the purpose of the church, that you're building in the unity of the faith, that our convictions and the faith grow together, right? That you don't grow out in a different direction, that your convictions aren't, okay, now we got to, we sort of got, your, your convictions aren't in left field, right? Like you could do that, but part of the church is to pull you together, that our convictions are growing together in faith, that unity of faith is coming. Not that all of our convictions are the exact same, right? That they're not. They're not going to be. There are certain liberties that we have that, that, that I can't speak to that in your life because you have that liberty. Now, it's not a doctrinal thing in the sense of you say, well, I can do whatever I want over here or engage in sin. But if it is a... You know, if it is uh, 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 something within the reason of Scripture, then then you have liberty. So we're not all just robots, right? We don't, we're not trying to create that we're all perfectly monolithic robots that we think the exact same. That's not going to be the case all the time. That's not going to be the case often. There's going to be certain things that we differ on, but with those principles of the faith um, that are so important that we're growing in those things together. <coughs> When, when we're growing in things like doctrine or doctrinal and <laughs> theological purity, that comes from, by the way, this, being unified with other brothers and being matured in a group. Um, 
and, and oftentimes when we think about the church, what do we talk about? We talk about love, right? The church talks about, well, well you're going to be know them by their love, right? And that should be common amongst believers. And again, that's a testimony to the world in a way because the church is different than the world. But again, it goes back to that root of it needs to glorify God. So our love that we have for one another needs to glorify God. Now tell me, do churches do that? Every church thinks that they're a loving church, by the way. I've never been to a church that says, you know what? Our church is the worst. We're all jerks. Never been in one of those. Everyone thinks that they're a loving church. But I've been in, been in very, 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 very few churches where the people genuinely care for one another. They genuinely do. They genuinely want to care for one another. They genuinely want to be around each and every person. But they want to. They care about it. It's real to them. That's not, that's not very common. Um, and so that's something we should want. That's a, something you should feel. Like that that's something we need, right? Um, so love should be apparent. And the love for one another, that should be growing. Like I don't, I don't want to love you the same way in five years. Now when we talk about that in marriage, that's obviously true. Love grows in that. I don't want to love you in the same way in five years. I want to love you more, better, as a brother in Christ, um, as a pastor, but but really as a brother in Christ, right? Um, it's also in in this unity. It, it's functioning in the way that what he mentions in verse um, sixteen, and that that we're all formed together, being fitted and held together. What every joint supplies. Kind of going back to that idea that Paul uses as a picture that everybody in the church has different roles and everybody has different gifts and things like that in the way of not everybody's the hand, not everybody's the foot, that First Corinthians framework there, not everybody's all these things. Well, in the context of the church, you use gifts. And I don't mean gifts of like, you know, underwater basket weaving, so I have to bring that to the church, right, the, all that stuff. Um, I'm talking about simply just the things that you're good at, right, the things that you're good at in the sense of like some people just their natural inclination is to serve others. You know, or natural. Now, now everybody needs to grow in those things. Um, natural inclination is to is to be really good at just. Man, they they love to go visit people and care for care for those people. They love to write letters, whatever it is. Um, those things are are pulled out in a church, right? They're not because we force those things. They're not because well, we got, everybody has to have a job to do. It's not that. It's those natural things, and those things again they bind us together. They bind us together. So the purpose of the church, to reiterate, is to go back to look at, okay, every part of what we do is for God's glory. Absolutely. And again, the means and the ends, both of those things, every part of the church, the means and the ends, not just the preaching of salvation to sinners and how we do that, but the salvation of sinners themselves, not just in what we do in the church as far as the time that we spend in the church, or where, or what we do, or how we sing, or what we preach, or how we fellowship, or how we text and you know send letters to one another. All that stuff, every bit of it, is for God's glory. It has to be. It absolutely has to be. I, I, I wanna I wanna kind of finish here. I, I know that I said you can ask questions, and and I don't. I probably didn't do it. I don't probably don't do a good job, good enough job of shutting up when you can't ask questions. But uh, I want you to maybe verbalize some of the things that 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 you've been that you've thought about, or even convictions about how. Not in a way that we're 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 like look at oh look at all these bad examples over here, but in a way that you think that maybe is a is a clear thing that the church should very much focus on, or or pay attention to that that maybe it's not, or or maybe. Maybe things that, that ways in which we've, you know, haphazardly fallen into a ditch of caring more about these other things that aren't God. How, how do you think that, that we, that we, we do that, that we have to, that we have to be careful of? Or things that, things that maybe you've even, that have been brought to mind tonight as we've kind of worked through this. <clears throat>
could actually require work like doing actually doing discipleship. Yeah. Um, not, I mean, I, I don't think you can really separate discipleship training from doing discipleship. I mean, because if if you're doing discipleship, you're 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 